We all have experience with pulse oximeters that fail in some patients. Typically, the failed uh, sensor locations are on the digits. And the nose, the nasal ala, is substantially protected from the things that affect the nose. I'm intentionally wearing two pulse oximeters, one on my finger, one on my nasal ala. And the idea behind this is to demonstrate the difference in the signal strength of the two locations. How do you make that demonstration? One way you can do that is, is to cause vasoconstriction in a clinical environment. I can do the equivalent of a norepinephrine or a phenylephrine challenge by putting my one extremity in cold water, a version of the cold presser test. And when, and when I do that, my foot in the cold water, my body vasoconstricts, and it vasoconstricts the entire peripheral circulation, which is why the blood pressure goes up and why the perfusion index from the digital sensor goes down and the one from the nose, which is perfused from the internal carotid coming down, the external carotid via the facial coming across is relatively protected. And you will see the same phenomenon in the intensive care unit. When you start a presser on someone, you'll see the peripheral signal will get smaller. If you are monitoring the perfusion index, you see that the signal strength gets smaller because of the vasoconstriction. It is photoplethysmography. If you imagine that you put your arm into a graduated cylinder full of water with each heartbeat, the water level would rise and then it would descend because systole fills up the arm with blood. Diastole, you lose that blood again. Same thing happens in other parts of the body, including at the nose where you are perfused by, back here at the ala, you're per perfused by both the internal carotid, carotid artery. Because the internal carotid auto-regulates with changes in blood pressure, it is what we would call a protected, a relatively protected circulation. The other thing you notice is, is you get an indication of the magnitude of the signal. The bigger the signal, the better what we refer to as the signal to noise ratio. And so in this case, his perfusion index, this is sort of a unitless number, is 2.4. We consider 0.3 or higher to be an adequate number. Ideally, you are over one, and I've seen this number as high as in the 20s. Generally, the number from the nose is much higher than it is from an extremity. So clinically, one of the things we're interested in is knowing at the first possible opportunity that there's been a change in the oxygen saturation. Obviously, the first place that change shows up is in the pulmonary veins, and then it has to get from there to wherever your pulse oximeter sensor is. And we know that it's a further distance from the heart to the fingertip than it is from the heart to the head where a nasal ALAR sensor would be. People very quickly accommodate to the presence of the probe. They are aware that there's a, a, a reddish light out of the corner of their eye because it's connected to the, usually uh, looped over the ear. When you move your head, the sensor doesn't move and you don't see motion artifact like you would from a finger sensor. The ALAR pulse oximetry should work on anybody that has an eligible ALAR monitoring site. Is it needed for every patient? No, of course not. But where it's valuable is the patient where a peripheral sensor isn't giving you a uh, reliable or an accurate signal. Uh, because you have a central circulation supplying this one that is much less vulnerable to the perturbations that happen physiologically than a peripheral sensor.